Right, good morning everyone uh, and welcome to this morning's webinar from PILTS. Uh, we're going to be covering the packaging machinery safety and the EN415 series of standards today. So I'm your presenter today, my name is Andy Maskell, I'm one of the account managers at PILTS and uh, yeah, we're going to be approximately about an hour today. Um, one of the most important things is please let us know if you can't hear me. Um, Obviously, at the minute, hopefully, uh, you should be hearing me loud and clear. Um, if you've got any questions uh, during the presentation, uh, you can just type questions in using the toolbar uh, to the right side of your screen. Uh, my colleagues, Tony Maiton and Jamie Thomas, are in the wings, uh, ready to answer your questions. Hopefully, we'll get them answered uh, during the time. If not, we'll certainly do this afterwards. Um, you'll automatically receive a link to the recording of this webinar a few hours after it's finished. Uh, and you should also see additional handouts from the presentation itself in the toolbar on the right hand side. Uh, you might not see the presentation, in fact, I haven't actually given it to anyone yet, so uh, you'll get a copy of that later on. So, what we're going to cover today, um, we're going to look at the different types of packaging machinery um, and then the presumption of conformity to the supply of machinery regulations, um, which was previously the machinery directive, uh, and we'll look at the designated standards along with that. Um, We'll look at an overview of the different types of standards and, and an overview of the most commonly used packaging machinery. Um, then we'll get into the main body of the webinar with Type C standards, and in, in this case, it's going to be the 415 series. Uh, we're going to look at parts one to ten. Uh, and finally, we'll look at a, a conclusion to the webinar. So, different types of packaging machinery. So, packaging machinery generally will focus on high speed for maximum production output. Um, and then obviously to try and reduce the downtime, uh, designed to reduce downtime, um, and certainly when it's related to safety issues. So it can be very damaging to profitability. Uh, so if there's any downtime for any reason. So packaging machinery uh, manufacturers basically will ensure that machines are running to maximum productivity by introducing levels of safety, which ensure the operator cannot come into harm. So packaging machinery is it's typically very fast. Uh, so the safety components can be as much about protecting the expensive machinery itself as well as the operators. But uh, as always, people come first. Typically, with regard to packaging machinery, we have three zones to consider. Um, you have your primary, secondary and finally pelletizing. So for the primary side, we may have a product being prepared into its singular form. It could be for soft drinks, toothpaste, powders, this kind of thing. Um, that is normally placed directly into the container or tube. Um, I mean, for instance, if you look at food and beverage pharmaceuticals and as an example, uh, there's hygiene considerations that uh, need to be taken into account um, at, at this primary stage. Um, the product's in direct contact with the packaging. So we'll see in the next slide show how this affects machinery construction and, and the types of materials used for those machines. Primary packing is then closed and this could be by capping, sealing before moving on to the secondary stage which might be grouping the product into different quantities say four or eight for soft drinks cans uh, and this is what you typically see at the supermarket. Uh, currently less plastics are being used in primary to secondary packaging due to environmental issues and recycling uh, and this is evident with multi-drinks multi cans that, and uh, the types of things we see on the shelves now uh, and a lot of them now sort of moving to securing these types of product with cardboard. The individual grouped uh, products then need to be prepared for secondary packs for shipment. With the soft drinks, for example, stacking them onto a pallet, but before you can load them onto a truck, you would need to secure them. So this could be overwrapping with cellophane or strapping. Then the pallets can be stored or sent for distribution. So here's a few example, uh, examples of primary filling machines. So this is where you'd be filling into individual bags, bottles, sachets, as I mentioned before. And as I also mentioned, the hygiene requirements for these type of machines. Generally, there's a lot of stainless steel on these machines for obvious reasons, for wash down and this, this kind of thing. Um, so it's uh, quite common that this, this is what you'll see. Examples of secondary machinery. So now we're looking at the uh, cartoning machines, shrink wrapping, uh, a singular product being packed into groups in the most efficient way to fit pallet sizes, for example. Yep, 
Here we have uh, examples of the st strapping machines. Um, and for these standards that we're actually looking at, this will be for less than 400 millimeters uh, for the actual packaging size. And then we have the palletizer type machinery. So in this example, we've just got the uh, quite a large shrink wrapper and a robot palletizer, which is becoming more and more common. Pallet, uh, pallet shrink wrapping machines. Uh, so here we've got uh, a, a pallet moving conveyor, uh, a cling film wrapper and bander. Uh, now, Continuous handling equipment is used between each zone uh, between these machines. And uh, so obviously these are covered by separate standards, which we will not cover today, uh, but definitely need to be considered uh, in anything that you're doing. With regard to integrated lines, if you're creating a packing line, either as an OEM or end user, then you may have a complex assembly in this case. And a UKCA mark would be required for the whole line and not the individual machines. So in the UK, the supply of machinery regulations 2008 applies to the assemblies of machines as well as to individual complete machines where they are assembled together to carry out a common function. The constituent parts are, functional, are functionally linked in a, such a way that each unit affects the operation of other units and the constituent units have a common control system and that's the most important part. So a group of machines that are connected to each other but where each machine functions independently of the others is not considered to be an assembly of machinery. So in the above sense, would not require an overall UKCA mark. Always a lot of confusion over that, over that element. We continually get asked questions on that daily. So presumption of conformity. So compliance with the standard is not mandatory. Um, but of course, um, compliance with the applicable essential health and safety requirements of the supply of machinery regulations is. So basically the use of the standards gives you this presumption of conformity and it's, it's best practice to use these standards. Um, the reason this statement's made is purely because if there's a completely different type of machine um, and the standards don't completely cover it, then obviously there might be some other considerations that need to uh, be put into play. But of course, you've got to justify that and you've got to demonstrate how that's been managed. Um, so as I said before, use of harmonized or the designated standards provide that automatic presumption of conformity and it's the best way to make sure that you comply. So we'll look at different types of standards. So I'm sure you've all seen this before, but we'll just go through this again, just to make sure, just to recap. Um, the A standards, or the A standard, because there's one, uh, specify fundamental concepts, terminology and principles. So we're looking at EN, ISO, 12100, uh, safety machinery, general, general principles for design, risk assessment and risk reduction. The B standards deal with certain machinery safety issues or certain types of safeguards that can be used across a wide range of machines. So for example, 14119 uh, for your, your interlocks. C type standards can uh, contain spec specifications for a certain individual type of machine or machine groups. And that's obviously what we're looking at today. Um, but it's also worth bearing in mind that a C standard will take precedence over any of the other standards. So we'll just uh, consider that. So the most relevant safety standards. So I've already mentioned ENISO 12100, um, and uh, basically we just focus on Annex B. Um, there are lots of examples and pictures of hazards, hazardous situations and hazardous events that you can use to check if they're present on your machine or not. These could include mechanical hazards, so it could be moving parts, for example. If it's electrical, it could be uh, uninsulated 230 volt terminals, non-IP rated, for example. Um, for thermal, this could be for ceiling packages. There might be noise, vibration, radiation, uh, materials or, or substances that might have an effect. Uh, on primary packing, this could be dependent on how you wash the machine down, say after any spillages. Um, hazardous situations are the various phases or stages when people come into contact with the machine during its life cycle. So include transport, assembly and installation, uh, commissioning, setting, teaching, programming, process changeover, operation. These all need to be considered. So hazard events are looking at contact with moving parts 
falling, ejection, loss of stability, breakup. So for primary package as an example, if you were filling a glass bottle under pressure and the filling process isn't controlled, then you could damage the bottle and get glass and glass shrapnel everywhere. For example, yeah, this is obviously don't want that to happen, but if you don't control it, this is possible. Um, it could be electrical arcs, for example, uncontrolled movement, emission of uh, hazardous substances, repetitive handling at high frequency. So EN1200 is a very generic standard and is applicable to any machine. And it's a requirement to conduct risk assessment of this type of all, all equipment, whether this applies to the OEM or end user. So it's very important that everyone refers to this standard, regardless of type of, uh, type of machine. So the start of a risk assessment procedure is to look at the limits of the machine, how big it is, where it's being positioned, and what speed it's going to be operating at, what material is being used, and within the limits, hazards need to be identified. Then you need to estimate the level of risk, and once this is done, eval evaluate the level of risk. Is it tolerable, or does it need to be reduced? If it's not adequately reduced, then a three-step method is used, starting with an inherently safe design measure. So protective measure which either eliminates hazards or reduces the risks associated with hazards by changing the actual design or operating characteristics of the machine without the use of guards or protective devices. So this is designing out your, your hazards. Safeguarding, this is where we use protective measures, uh, protective safeguards to protect persons from the hazards which cannot be reasonably be eliminated or sufficiently reduced by design. So we're talking about guarding interlocks, like curtains, for example, uh, and we'll touch on these types of product and solutions as we go through the webinar. Information for use generally gets overlooked uh, in my experience, but this is quite an important part and parcel of the, of, of the whole process. And this is a, a protective measure in itself. Uh, and this is the you know measure for consistent of communication links, for example, signs, signals, symbols, warning devices, and, and safe operating procedures. Um, and obviously it's also training is part of this. Um, so if a protective measure is dependent on a control system, then either 13849 or 62061 should be used for functional safety. And then it's a loop to see if these other hazards have been generated by protective measures and has the risk been adequately reduced. So here are some of the most commonly used B-type standards, uh, they're not in any particular order, um, and uh, I'm not going to go through every single one, you'll thank me for that, but there are some popular ones there such as 14119 and the, the technical report that was generated for, for this, which is TR24119, um, which cover the requirements for interlock devices uh, and also cover the very popular topic of fault masking, um, which we'll touch on briefly later uh, in the webinar. The C standards for packaging machines are listed here uh, and go from part one to part 10 and all have various dates of release. Part one has terminology and classification determining what type of packaging machine you have and, and how to identify which of the following parts of the standard apply. Part nine is not for any particular packaging machine but covers all and part 10 is general requirements uh, and it's just there to supplement all the other parts. Um, where new methods of automation or robots, for example, are used and fill some of the gaps uh, that exist in, in the other parts, part two and part four uh, were both released in the 1990s, so are old and not harmonized. Uh, they're not designated to either the machinery directive or, or annex. So disregarding this, it's recommended that they still used uh, where relevant. It's very common for the C-type standards to refer to older standards that have been superseded, and you'll see this throughout the presentation. So I, I, you might find me repeating myself again and again, but uh, it's just to emphasize the point that this is the case. So I'll run through the structure of a standard, and then we'll go into the 415 set of standards in more detail. Um, the main sections are all normative, meaning that they are prescriptive, and they have to be followed in order to comply. So you can't pick and choose which bits you, uh, you adhere to and which bits you don't. So section one, we have the scope. Section two is normative references. So we're basically saying that other standards could apply. 
uh, section three terms and definitions section four list of hazards so this is where you you'll still need to conduct your own risk assessment uh, regardless of the uh, the hazard list there section five safety requirements and measures so what you need to do to reduce the risk effectively section six verification of safety requirements and measures section seven information for use after the main uh, section are the annexes and these are generally uh, informative meaning that they are descriptive to help the reader to understand concepts described in the normative parts so the structure of a c standard um, generally you'll have the, the list of associated standards and as i've mentioned these might not be the, the current state of the art harmonized standards but obviously uh, just just bear that in mind um, We'll have the, there's a the relationship with the requirements of the machinery directive or the supply of machinery, uh, evaluation of energy or force, maximum values for inherently safe design, uh, and there will be mentioned in some cases, not all, but you might find that there's a minimum performance level, category, etc. Uh, it might just state the category, uh, and we'll get into this a bit more later because obviously now we need, we need to apply the principles of 13849 and not 954 1 as it was. So, as I mentioned, the annexes can be normative where they describe a particular activity, such as noise level testing, methods of safeguarding. Uh, it might be uh, light guard muting, for example. So, this section of the standard, uh, we'll look at 415 1, sorry. This section of the standard lists every type of packaging machine and machinery alphabetically and gives a short description along with uh, informing you of which part of the standard it applies to so for example a screw capping machine the definition reference is 3221 which reads close a machine which applies a threaded cap or lid usually to a rigid, rigid container and the standard for this for example here as it shows is 415-2 so that gives you a lead into which standard is applying to which machine quite straightforward so just to be clear, you do not need to have 415-1. So you don't need to purchase it if you know what type of packaging machine you have and which standards apply. So they might seem a bit obvious, but you might need to just look at those, um, uh, the actual justification for which type of machine you're actually building uh, and the definitions given in that standard. So 415-2. This covers the, the preformed rigid container packaging machinery. Uh, these include uh, machines for bottles, cans, cups, jars, kegs, casks, barrels, for example. So quite a long list there. Uh, they may be made of glass, metal, plastics, or, or even composite materials. The containers are not normally manufactured by the machine itself uh, and can be sealed by a, a seamed end, a cap, a cork, a foil, lid, or, or something similar. The machines pack liquid, cream, paste, powder uh, in preformed rigid containers. They can also sort, invert, clean, inspect, pasteurize, sterilize, and label these containers as part of the process. So it can, uh, these, these machines can get quite complex. So for one, uh, this uh, 415-2, so this standard is not listed in the gov.uk website, so it's not designated to the supply of machinery safety regulations or harmonised to the machinery directive. It refers to A and B standards that are now superseded, which I mentioned before. However, it's still better than having no reference at all. The reference uh, to superseded standards is common for C-type standards, as I've already mentioned. So you can justify your compliance with the essential health and safety requirements but you need to double check against the uh, EHSRs within the regulations to ensure that they're all adequately dealt with. Where standards have been superseded, it's always recommended that you use the latest state of the art, as I've already mentioned. And you can get this list from the, uh, the, the OJ on, on the EU website uh, or the gov.uk website. Um, and if you're not sure, just, just ask us and we'll, we'll point you in the right direction for that as well. So 4152 in general, um, common hazards include mechanical, thermal, electric, uh, which obviously apply for a lot of other machines as well, but they're going to very a bit, bit more specifics uh, within this standard. So importantly, hazards caused by faults in the control system. 
um, specific machine hazards are also identified for rinses, capping machines, uh, thermal heat sealers, labeling and coding machines. It then specifies both common safety requirements uh, and machine specific safety requirements in great detail. And in doing so, we'll cross reference all appropriate standards from where they've been derived. But this will always come up as well. Uh, first and foremost, it specifies that, that a formal risk assessment must be carried out on the machine. Section four of this standard identifies significant hazards during filling and cleaning, such as crushing, stabbing for mechanical, uh, electrocution or fire uh, for electrical, and then down to combination hazards, which in this case could be pressurized hot liquid, like the example used earlier, where if not controlled adequately, then the glass bottle would shatter, for example. Section five identifies examples of protection from these hazards by using machine specific type examples. So with guards, fixed guards and or interlock guards with guard locking and appropriately designed and positioned tunnel guards on in feeds and out feeds. So 850 millimeters for full arm or if waist height then 500 mil. Uh, with regard to light guards, uh, light curtains or light beams using EN ISO 13855 to determine their correct use and safe positioning. So we're going to cover a lot of um, what's actually mentioned in section 5112. Uh, we're going to cover this in 415 uh, section 4 and 6 um, because it mentions in 954-1. Um, so the introduction of 13849 standards means a slightly different approach is required and functional safety uh, such as performance level, A to E considered and not just categories as I've probably mentioned several times before but this is unfortunately a theme that exists with older standards. So again this, this section here the cleaning setting and maintenance section um, that unfortunately older superseded standards again mentioned um, but of course you'll actually see um, where the older standards are mentioned, you'll see the list later on, which would be handy once you've actually got a copy of this presentation to see uh, where something's been superseded, what the current standard actually is, the equivalent of. Um, so that'd be a useful list to have. Other points to consider, um, inspection points for viewing critical parts of the machine, um, depressurizing uh, systems prior to access by using guard locking, so the guard cannot be opened until the pressure is at a safe level. The machine may require extraction or ventilation systems if any toxic fumes are generated. Um, there may even be the need to have Legionella taken into account if recirculating water. Um, and uh, there's also mention of the mutant of light guards, uh, which we'll go into later. Four one five three um, looks at form fill and seal machines, uh, and of course, there's, there's many different types of these, and there's an example of a few there, uh, and the types of product that's uh, that's that's managed with these machineries. Um, if we move on to the actual standard, so the vertical fill and uh, seal machines, which are typically used in the snack uh, snack industry for crisps and snacks, for example. Um, section 4 details specific hazards for the above types of machines, such as being clamped and burnt by the hot jaws of a sealing mechanism uh, on a vertical form fill and seal machine. There's an awful lot of hazards in there associated with that type of, uh, of issue and injuries potentially. Um, and it just gives you an idea of actually how to manage those. Obviously, I'm not going to absolute specifics today. There's, a, there's an awful lot in there, but it gives you an idea of the sorts of things that uh, are specifically managed. Four one five four deals with palletizers and, and depalletizers. So just a few examples there of a, a robot palletizer, bottle depalletizer, uh, as examples. And again, these tend to be rather large machines. Um, so the hazards just by looking are fairly obvious to start with. So um, it's quite important to actually uh, reference these standards to deal with those specific hazards. Four one five four is not harmonised or designated again, but still represents best practice. It mentions types of loading for pallet and depalletizer applications, identifies zones, 
So boundaries of the machine and the safeguards along the operator area. So common hazards are also identified such as mechanical, impact, electrical, ejection, and so on. It then specifies common safety requirements for the above types of machine and cross references with appropriate standards. And again, same statement, it specifies that a formal risk assessment must be carried out on the machine. There's a theme developing. So the separate guidance on the uh, UK HSE website dealing with palletizers um, due to the fact that they are recognised as being a, a very dangerous machine or a very dangerous type of machine. Uh, and in fact, if you actually go on the HSE website there, uh, which is a link for it, um, you'll find that there's an awful lot of guidance documents which are extremely useful and they're free to download. So uh, make use of that where you can. Most injuries occur when operators or maintenance personnel enter the machine and become trapped between fixed parts and moving parts such as transfer heads, sweepers, pushers. Um, and obviously the, the risk is made greater by the unexpected nature of the machine movements. There's also hazards from falling loads, sudden movements of jammed product or pallets that are freed, or by movement due to failure to dump stored energy in pneumatic or hydraulic systems. Section five starts by saying not all hazards are identified in 415-4 due to the complexity and the variety of machinery. So in this case, again, a full risk ass assessment must be carried out. Um, I'm going to keep repeating that because unfortunately it doesn't happen all the time, but you need to consider that uh, in each case. Um, so this will obviously identify examples of, of protection for, uh, from these hazards, given machine specific examples, fixed guards and perimeter guards with interlocking and guard locking again, uh, function to control, uh, to control access. It states EN 294, which is now replaced by 13857. Uh, light curtains or light beams to determine safe and correct positioning uh, and the interlocks uh, along with light curtains, e-stops, all these things uh, should be connected to an appropriately designed safety related control system. Uh, and in this standard, again, it mentions 954-1. However, as I've already mentioned, and we all know, this has been withdrawn. Uh, so everything that uh, should, should be this reference 954-1 should be determined using the 13849-1 structure uh, and in this case performance level is likely to be between PLC to PLE but again this is to be determined by risk assessment. So sometimes um, it's the case that you will have suspended load on palletizers um, and so if there's an energy loss this could create a, a gravity fall. So restraints should be used, which are automatic uh, and be effective up to the full load of the system. It can be done by mechanical or hydraulic locking, by braking, by anti-fall devices such as pulls, which take a pallet or layer transfer, uh, uh, or sorry, which lock a pallet or layer transfer lift platform. And it's just an example there from the standard itself uh, showing the arrangement for that. So it's advised that teaching in relation to robotic systems should be done outside the interior zone. So don't be inside the guard teaching the machine, even if you're experienced and know the hazards, as generally the movement will be fast, quite sudden and inescapable. And uh, I'm sure there'll be some questions about that because every robot uh, teaching system or teaching uh, that I've seen will, uh, will always be the persons inside the cell uh, stood next to the robot um, with a, a dead man's handle or dead man's switch. Um, so uh, the standard states that you should be outside, not inside. So uh, that will probably cause some discussion. So here we have some examples of uh, for cross beam muting uh, for the in and out feed, where direction of, of travel is always the same. Guidance can be found in uh, 62046, and it should be pointed out that the cross point should be in the danger zone. Um, non-safe zone, not in line with the light guard itself. Part five covers wrapping machines and there's a couple of examples here. Um, so examples of continuous flow wrapper, uh, high speed wrapper, a tray wrapper um, with a heat shrink tunnel and a horizontal wrapper. Just a few uh, of this type of machine really. In general, it's important to point out that 
uh, section five only covers wrapping machines designed to handle products less than 400 millimeters, which I mentioned uh, near the beginning. Anything above this is covered by part six. So it does cover bigger machines. So just bear that in mind when you're referencing these standards. It's important to note. So here we have uh, pallet wrapping machines of the, of the larger kind, as you can see from the, the images there. Um, so here we have a stretch wrapper, rotary wrapper, an inline rotary wrapper, and a hood wrapper. These are used to stable a load before being placed into racking or being dispatched. So this standard is relatively new uh, and lists a number of machines. Um, I'll give you a, a, well, you've got the list there, but I'll just go through them quickly. So you've got pallet banding machines, stretch film pallet wrapping machines, stretch film hood application machines, mobile stretch film wrapping machines, semi-automatic self-driving stretch film wrapping machines. So a lot of examples there. Um, and I'm sure that if you go into the standard, you can uh, see quite a few more. So that's not all of them. Um, so as with all the other standards, it does date. And I've mentioned it before. A formal risk assessment must be carried out. It's not just the case of read the standard, apply it, and then everything's OK. You still have to do that risk assessment. The machine might have some other issues, hazards that are not managed in that standard. So common hazards that are identified are listed here with entanglement and, and drawing in being the most common, but would depend on the nature of the pallet wrapper. So of course, these are serious hazards and of course, you don't want to come into contact with them. Quite important to, uh, to reference the standard. And as I said before, this is why you do a risk assessment. Specific hazards are then listed in sections relating to the part of the pallet wrapper machine. Um, if we looked at uh, 4.3.2, the standard will look at the rotary table, uh, the film reel assembly, film clamp, the hold down device, uh, conveyor and the top sheet feeder uh, in a bit more detail. Um, so 4.4.2 uh, manages hazards common to the most uh, to most shrinking systems and this will look at the thermal hazards, gas heating uh, elements, hazards associated with, with the types of material and other substances and hazards generated by noise. The, then there's some specifics on safeguarding. Um, so 52213 looks at the fixed and interlocking guards. Where open top distance guards are used, they should be safeguarded by fixed or interlock guards complying with EN 953. So again, this is where we have the superseded standards. So this is now replaced by 14120, for example. Um, and the distance now should be at least two meters high from the floor. Section 52215, um, presence in the danger zone where it's not possible to see the interior of a machine uh, from the control panel, provision of closed circuit television, or use of a trap key system is suggested, and means of resetting light, light guards, light curtains, shall be out of reach from within the danger zone. So if it's full body access, I would recommend a trap key uh, system over CCTV, because then somebody needs to be constantly watching um, watching it and as, a, as opposed to an operator having the personnel key on them from the trap key system, which prevents the machine from being restarted. Section 52217. So this looks at the stopping time for these types of machine. So again, this is why the C standard will override everything else. It's very specific about this being uh, not less than one set. Uh, sorry, the machine should be less than one second after the opening of an interlock guard. Um, so this is where you would consider the use of an electromechanical braking system or appropriate variable speed drive. Uh, if it's not one second, then the guard needs to be moved further away from the hazard or uh, use guard locking, which prevents the door being opened until it's at a standstill. Section 52318 uh, looks at the uh, emergency stops. Um, so e-stop actuators must be spaced no more than five meters apart. Um, general requirements for e-stops uh, generally are where an operator is stood at a control station, um, but it also states no more than five meters. Cool. 
So 4156, um, this standard was written before 13849 came into effect, and so not all parts of it have been harmonized. Surprise, surprise. And these parts uh, still refer to EN 954-1. Um, so this states that non-programmable safety functions must meet at least category one, which now translates to performance level C uh, with regard to 13849. Safety functions incorporating drives or servos must achieve at least category three, um, which with reference to 13849 uh, is now performance level D. PLCs and, and software use must meet design requirements of IEC 61508 and safety functions must meet SEAL 2 of EN 62061, uh, equivalent to PLD uh, with regard to 13849. Standard does not specify category zero or category one stop functions um, according to 60204 but as mentioned previously the category one stop must be achieved within one second two hand control stations must meet type three uh, for en 574 again a superseded standard which is now uh, 13854 type three uh, is where each button must have two normally open uh, contacts which both need to be operated within half a second of each other This part of the standard is showing the difference in the dimensioning of, uh, of the side garden. If a person needs to enter via the front and not the side, for example, why would we need a 500 mil gap? Well, at this stage, the goods are not wrapped. So one may drop to the floor, or there may be a blockage that needs clearing. 500 mil is the minimum gap big enough for someone to go in, clear the machine and avoid crushing. They're protected by the light curtain and the reset is out of reach. The gap, but the outfeed is 120 millimeters, as there should be no longer been a need for, uh, to enter this way, as the goods are now all wrapped and secured. The height of the guard should not be less than two meters, with a maximum gap at the bottom of 240 mil. The height of the light curtain is not specified in this case. However, if we look at the annex, it mentions two scenarios for light beam placement. If you have a two meter guard at ground level and then three light beams should be used positioned at 400, 800 and 1200 from the floor. And at a minimum reach distance of 900 mil, depending on stopping time, and that's less than 0.4 seconds. Or if you have a two meter guard that extends above a conveyor, then two beams should be positioned at least 400 and 900 mil above the conveyor. And at a minimum reach distance of 1200 mil, again, depending on the stopping time, in this case, less than 0.6 seconds. If the stopping time is greater than you would need to calculate the stopping distance using 13855. Most light guards uh, and ESP type systems will easily um, cover this, uh, th these dimensions uh, and in most cases they actually exceed the requirement. But uh, as I say, this is still an older standard. So uh, it just needs that risk assessment again, uh, just to ensure that you're covering all the hazards. Four one five part seven is group and secondary packaging machinery. So blister packer, case packer, uh, tray former, carton sealer, uh, and they take primary packs and group and pack them into secondary packs in the correct quantities. So section four hazards relating to these machines, again, thermal, noise, and then specific hazards from tray or case erecting, case taping, etc. So again, this standard being a bit older mentions that we're, um, where, where open top guards are used, they should be at least uh, 1.6 meters from the floor and not two meters. Um, sorry about that little pop-up. Um, <laughs> and uh, so you can use 1.6 meters as it's a harmonized standard. The gap for cleaning under distance guards should be no greater than 240 mil. Section five talks about safety requirements, uh, requirements and some specifics in particular, tunnel guards at the infeed and outfeed again, uh, and the dimensions that should be used. An e-stop should be positioned within 400 mil of the guard and instructions should be provided for gaining access. Mm -hmm. 
Section 5 and safeguarding, uh, similar requirements to 4156 for the whole body access and reset function, while it also mentions automatic detection of persons within the danger area. And then just uh, continuing on from that, just uh, safeguarding there, continue with a few more elements. So, so again, mentioning stopping time of the machine uh, and emergency stop distances. So this is where we mentioned that, uh, so the safety related controls, it's exactly the same as part six, um, and just specifies the requirements again for the different types of uh, PLCs or software and their minimum requirements. So we're gonna dive off into a, a secondary packaging solution, just to make you aware of, uh, of the types of uh, technology that's out there and solutions for these machines that meet these requirements. Uh, in this case, it's a, a safe monitoring of cardboard feed. Um, you can get more information on this from us uh, if, uh, if this is something that you're interested in, but we'll just dive into this now. So as it shows here, this is actually a TUV approved um, system. So you haven't got to do uh, a great deal to get this um, to, to get it proven, just basically go through the normal process of risk assessment, make sure this is applicable. So this solution is to prevent operators from reaching into the machine through the empty material feed uh, and obviously trapping their hands, getting injured, et cetera. So as long as there's enough cardboard in the magazine, it's not possible to reach into the danger zone. Um, if the cardboard goes to such a low level, then the sensors that you can see there will actually uh, detect that and stop the machine. Now, in this particular case, there's, there's some options in terms of, of how to achieve this, which you can see here. So you can use the Pilch Multi, you can use uh, uh, other um, uh, a modular system, uh, the PNOZ uh, system. So as it shows there, you've just got the, the two sensors, and in both cases, just creating the logic in order to, uh, to switch the machine off. So break back into EN415. We move on to strapping machines. Uh, so there's a table strapper, uh, an automatic strapper, an inline strapper, and a pallet strapper. So just a few examples there uh, for 4158. So into the specifics of the standard, um, it, the, the types of strapping machines uh, powered by hand, semi-automatic, uh, all completely automatic, horizontal pallets, um, but not strapping tools that are powered exclusively by manual effort. There's some uh, specific hazard listed in section four. Um, so just basically stating that strapping machines incorporate moving parts, which present a variety of mechanical hazards, including crushing, shearing, cutting, entanglement, uh, friction, and drawing in. So again, stored energy in pneumatic and hydraulic systems can cause a few of these hazards, uh, certainly after the machine's been switched off. So that needs to be considered. Um, and then the obvious hazards, uh, if the arms or header between the strap loop and the product, there's a definite shearing hazard if the trap person tries to pull their arm or hand out up from under the sharp edge of the tension strap. Part nine is noise measurement. If there are no levels in the specific part of the standard that covers your machine, then you can take this part nine for guidance. So again, another sort of section that tends to sort of get overlooked, but uh, still as important as the others. <clears throat> section 10 uh, is a complementary standard, which kind of mops up any bits that are missing from the other parts. Uh, <laughs> it's basically how I'd summarize it. So, for example, fixed and interlocking movable guards, unless otherwise specified in other parts of 415, open top distance guards should be at least two meters high from the floor or other access platform. We saw them in 4157 that 1.6 meters can be used uh, depending on the type of machine. Uh, and where there's a gap between the guard and the floor, um, say for cleaning or removing packs, and the gap is greater than 240 millimeters, a guard should be fitted underneath to prevent access to hazard points from underneath. 
Again, earlier we saw that the gap can be a maximum of 240 mil, but now we can make it larger, but we'd have to fit additional horizontal guards, for example, to prevent access. So here we have an example. Um, this is a, a pallet wrapping machine, which would fall under EM4156. So with a number of previously discussed products on it, so an unwrapped pallet with packed products on it will make its way to the start of the pallet wrapper via an infeed. At the entrance, we have a set of light guards uh, and muting sensors, which have been set up to determine if it's a pallet heading toward the light guard. If it is, then the light curtain will be temporarily muted and the muting lamp above the light guard will illuminate to warn personnel. The light curtain is now muted. If it was a person to go along the conveyor for any reason, then they wouldn't be able to break the muting sensors in the correct sequence and the light guard would still be active and stop the machine. So light curtains are typically used at the in-feed and out-feed of the wrapping machine. We then have an interlock guard on the side of the machine, which might be for operators or maintenance personnel to set up the machine or carry out fault finding. But the guard needs to be closed uh, in order to run the machine. Um, so basically, we then have an interlock guard set uh, for operators and maintenance, uh, sorry, that the guard needs to be closed to run the machine. However, it needs to be necessary to run the machine at low speed with the guard open. So certain operations can be conducted. Uh, and this may be done uh, via a two-hand control or an enabling switch or similar. Um, but this will enable a safe slow speed, for example, uh, and safe operation. So the hazards are reduced. Um, so yeah, this will just prevent anyone coming into contact with any moving parts. Uh, and in this case, of course, you would only want authorised and trained people to carry out this task anyway. Um, you can do this, for example, with the use of RFID keys. Uh, and we, we have a device called PIP mode, for example, that would allow you to do this. So if you don't have the correct RF, RFID key, you can't carry out the task. You're not authorised. So just a, a quick example, really, of, of how that's managed uh, and what a safe setup would be. And uh, and how you can achieve that. So again, if you've got any questions on that, just let us know. With regard to safeguarding and complementary technologies on the machine, um, as you can see on this page, yes, it's all yellow. It's, it's yeah, it's from Pilts. Um, but I won't go through every single one of these, but I think it's fairly obvious what they are. But again, it just gives you an idea of some of the technology that's out there. Um, so one of the most important developments of recent years has been uh, such a piece in code, for example, like RFID type switches, intelligent switches. Um, so the, the coding uh, to prevent manipulation, um, uh, unintentional access or intentional access in this case. Um, and then monitoring the guard positions, so whether it's open or closed. Um, got the PCEN M lock, which is used for guard locking. Uh, so if a machine has a rundown time where you don't want to interrupt a product cycle, then you request to enter, and when it's safe to do so, and everything has come to a standstill, or the production cycle has stopped, uh, the solenoid in the uh, M lock is energized, and the lock allows the guard to be opened. Uh, the PCN S lock is also a popular product on packaging machines, um, but it's also used to hold guards closed until the process is completed. So it's not being used as a safety interlock; it's being used to protect the process itself. Then there's an RFID code inside to determine if the guard is open to stop the machine from being restarted. Then we have solutions such as uh, PCN radar, scanners, uh, and uh, the OP2 light cones. So these are typically used where there's no physical guard, but you need to detect if someone is either approaching or in the danger area. Typically used on the back end of palletizers or wrappers, uh, and then we have complementary measures such as e-stops, mode selection, and RFID keys, which we've, uh, we've mentioned before. So packaging machinery tend to have lots of guards, covers, uh, which during use may have, may have to be opened uh, to clear blockages for maintenance and so on, uh, but definitely need to be closed during operation and to start. And so, it could be useful to have a switch on, on them so you can determine which cover is opened or which switches have failed. But if you don't want to wind them individually back to a panel because of cost or distance, but connect them in series across the machine without fault masking. So to do this, we use the transistor type intelligent switches with OSSDs. 
uh, which can be connected in series, which are then integrated into the, the safety device diagnostics. Uh, in this case, we've got a safety diagnostics unit, um, which can relay the actual status of the individual uh, components in the field. So you can then actually relay the information up to uh, the upstream PLC. Um, in this case, you would know then which guard or cover has opened, and it reduces the overall wiring, and more, more importantly than anything else, it reduces downtime. So there's various technologies at different levels, and just an example here, uh, you've got your, your standard discrete safety type relays, uh, configurable systems, and then uh, you've got all the connectivity to all the different field buses uh, and networks, uh, and then full-blown uh, automation controllers. Now, with all the guards and covers, etc., that you associate with packaging machinery, there's a, a, a call for this these decentralised uh, type of uh, of units. And here's just a an example of uh, the, the IP67 types of uh, decentralized systems that we've got. Um, these are absolutely superb as a solution just for the fact that it reduces the wiring uh, and it just simplifies the, the, the complete system. Just by the fact that you've got a five, five wire cable going out to a module that can then be daisy chained, um, and then you can power your sensors, whether it's light guards, RFID sensors, whatever it might be, and, and obviously it shows some examples there. So a very powerful system, um, but very easy to implement. So as a conclusion, um, unless you know what type of packaging machine you have, identify it using 415 part one. Then use the 415 parts nine and 10 in conjunction with whichever 415 standard applies to your machine. 415 parts two to eight will highlight the most common hazards and the safety requirements. However, you must conduct your own risk assessment, as I've said many times. Um, and of course, we've already said this many times as well. Many of the 415 standards make reference to withdrawn and out of date standards. So I recommend where replacement standards exist, use them. And there's a few examples there, as I mentioned earlier for you. So if there's anything else that you need from us, just let us know. So thanks for listening today. Um, hopefully that's been of some use for you. Um, you will get a copy of the presentation and we'll make that available later. Um, now you can also access the uh, previous webinars and uh, the next webinar that we have will be on Friday the 30th of September and we'll go into safe motion. So uh, not one that's been covered um, that I've seen very much. So uh, that hopefully will, uh, will create some interest and be of use. So again, thanks for listening and have a good weekend.